Hello and welcome to this review of a model that contains a screw joint. Now this is in Workbench Mechanical. We have two bodies. You can see one here with a little projection on the side. That just makes it easier to see the part rotate. And we have a base below that. Workbench Mechanical does not support a screw type joint in which rotation around an axis automatically implies translation along the axis because of screw threads. To understand this model, let's first look at the coordinate systems. There's your global Cartesian set. Here's a coordinate system for what's called joint 1, and here's one for joint 2. And you can see that it's out here on the axis of this long rod. We've defined a number of remote points in this model, and they are going to be used in joint definitions further down. Here's one called my remote point on rod. So it sits on the rod down here at the base, centered on the rod. My remote point on base, same location in space. It's interacting with the face of this rectangular base, and how much it affects is being controlled by the pinball region that's drawn here. There's a remote point for applied rotation, and that's up here at the end of the rod. Moving on, there are joints in this model. First, a revolute joint. It's here, and it's going to affect the axis of this long rod. You can see the blue z-axis here, rotating relative to this base and the points are at the origin of this local coordinate system. Now, here's the tricky part. We have some APDL commands inserted. They refer to the local joint using the parameter underscore JID. So my JID is made equal to that. Then we go to work. For that element, we put in a key opt command and use choice 17, which is a screw joint. So what was a revolute joint becomes a screw joint. Next, we do section definitions. We indicate that the section type is a screw joint with this command. We indicate a local coordinate system, and it's 9999 and 9999 at the two sides of the joint. What is that coordinate system? Let's go up above. Here was my coordinate system for joint 1. We set up a manual value for the coordinate system number and put in a very large number that won't conflict with anything else in this small model, 9999. So in here we indicate that that's the coordinate system to use. Finally, we indicate the pitch of this screw joint and it's set to the number 5. Since this model is operating in millimeters, if I go up to units, you'll see that it's millimeters. This means we're going to have 5 millimeters of pitch per radian of rotation. So to see how far you would move axially in one completely 360 degree rotation, you would be multiplying that number by 2 pi. You have to be very careful. Because of this APDL command, you have to run your model, solve your model in the system of units that's assumed when this number 5 is put in. Here it's intended to mean 5 millimeters per radian of revolution, and you have to be quite careful about that. Going to the next joint, we have a revolute joint relative to ground. And all we have here is a reference coordinate system. You can see what it looks like. We'll be rotating around the z-axis in a revolute joint. Let's go back and look at this revolute joint a bit. We're putting in a little resistance to that free rotation, one newton millimeter per degree. Let me go back. In the joint above, we've also put in one newton millimeter per degree. We're putting a little stiffness in there, and it in fact gives us something to check for convergence. Here's the third joint. Now the reason for this joint being put in was to drive a rotation here, and by setting it up as a general joint, the coordinate system is going to undergo large rotations. 
there is a commands object. You can see familiar things here. My JID is equal to underscore JID. Then the key op sets the joint type to 16, which is the general joint. We indicate that all degrees of freedom are active. We go in and we ensure it's changed to a general joint type. We indicate the coordinate system we want, which is now 8888, 8888. And if I go up and look at joint 2, you can see where we're acting. And that's been given the manual coordinate system number of 8888, with the blue z-axis being the axis around which we want to turn. Back down to the APDL object, and we see that we have not fixed any of the degrees of freedom. So this general joint appears not to be doing anything, but it gives us something that we can turn, and the applied rotation can undergo large movements in space and still work. It might be noted that a follower element might be able to be attached to a remote point attached to the end here, but we haven't taken that approach. There is an alternative in getting this kind of screw joint, which is to use a constraint equation. This one has been suppressed, and in here you can relate a relative rotation to a translation along a z-axis. The problem with this is that constraint equations do not respect large rotations in space. And in this model, we're going to have a large rotation around this z-axis and a large rotation around this base. One rotation compounded on the other. And the only way to cope with that is to go to the general joint and drive a rotation on the blue end here. The coordinate system you see pictured right here will be reoriented in space during the analysis and everything works. The constraint equation where we have multiple rotations compounded on each other would not work because it's not updated for new orientations in space at every sub-step. We have a little bit of meshing control and you can see the mesh for this particular model. Let's go down and look at the analysis now. We have 90 substeps. We're going to go through a large number of substeps, both for convergence and also so that we have points that let us animate the movement. It's been set to a direct solver because it's a small model and also because there will be MPC-184 elements involved. We have turned off weak springs and we have large deflection turned on. We're putting in two rotations, a 90 degree rotation by the base, and at the same time that the base is rotating along this local z-axis, we have a second rotation. It's a 90 degree rotation of the axis of this rod, and this is applied up here at the end that's colored blue. Even though the symbol shows the rotation down here, at the base, the rotation's being applied here, and we'll see evidence of that in a moment. First, here's the deformation of the model. Now let me animate this. There's two rotations happening at the same time. You can see that the long rod rotates while the base rotates. There's a second thing happening here. There's movement along the axis of that cylinder because of the screw joint that's been implied. Let's go over and look at the animation of the other. And something to notice is that this gap opens up because both rotations are happening at the same time and we implied a screw joint with these APDL commands in here. So let's go look at animation of the right-hand view of this model and we'll play and see that the joint is opening up as the rotation of that circular rod takes place. Now let's look at a stress plot. You can see 
stresses concentrated in here and also the state of stresses that would be expected with torsion on a long rod. This is evidence that my first joint rotation is in fact being applied out here and causing stresses in that long rod. Finally, a joint probe at the bottom has been set up to tell us what's happening and you'll notice a 15.708 millimeter z-axis movement. There's the blue z-axis. Let's go back. We indicated 5 millimeters per radian of revolution. We put in a pi radian revolution here. 180 degrees is pi pi revolution. And if we go down, there's that 15.708. Let's bring up a calculator. Let's put in 5 millimeters per radian times 3.14159 to convert. And 15.7079 or 708. We have the axial movement that we expect for a 180 degree revolution. So this is a means of implying a screw joint that also works under large rotations in a general mechanism. Thank you for joining me.